All right, let's turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. I think after we get through some of these preliminary chapters, we'll start moving a little quicker through the book of Genesis, but I think we ought to take our time. This is the foundation, and uh, if you want to have a strong building, you've got to have a strong foundation. And the book of Genesis is the foundation for the rest of the Bible. But in Genesis chapter 4, last time we looked at verses uh, 1 and 2, and uh, we noticed here that although Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters, and that's found in Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, uh, two children, where evidently their two first children were Cain. The word Cain means what? Anybody remember? Possession. Possession. That's right. Evidently, uh, he was a treasured young man. And then the second boy was Abel. And what does his name mean? Do you remember? Vanity. That's right, vanity. And so some people speculate that these were twins. And it's just like Esau and Jacob. Esau came first and then Jacob came after. Um, in the same way, uh, Cain came and then Abel came. But in any case, Cain was older than Abel. And uh, we, we noted that last time. And then in verse number two, it says, uh, And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Abel was a shepherd, and so he cared for goats and sheep, whatever it was that they had, and Cain was a farmer. And that's one thing I learned when I went out west. They differentiate between farmers who grow crops and ranchers who raise animals. And so you might say that uh, Abel was a rancher and Cain was a farmer. Two offerings were given, verses 3 through 5. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his <laughs> offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So we see two offerings that were given here. We have Cain. And he brought vegetables and fruit that he had grown. And he offered it on the altar to God. And this offering that he brought was rejected. It was rejected by God. Abel, on the other hand, brought a lamb and sacrificed the lamb. And that offering was accepted by God. And so some people say, well, how do they know whether their offering was accepted or rejected? And I have one of those uh, images from my Sunday school childhood burned in my head <laughs> where uh, Abel's smoke is going up and Cain's smoke is going like that. <laughs> so I don't know if that is what happened or I don't know if someone said that maybe, you know, at that point offerings were consumed by fire from heaven and maybe God sent down his fire from heaven on Abel's offering and not on Cain's offering. You know, we don't know how they could tell the difference, but we know that Abel's offering was accepted, Cain's offering was rejected. So then the question we ask ourselves is, why was Cain's offering rejected while Abel's was accepted? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11. Verse number four. It says here, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Now verse number six says, But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And one of the things we see here about Abel's offering that set it apart from Cain's is that Abel's offering was given by faith. He was trusting. He was trusting, I believe, in the promise that God had made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that one day the seed of the woman would be bruised in the heel by Satan. But then Satan himself, through the seed of the woman, would have his head crushed. 
I think he was believing that when God slew that animal and clothed Adam and Eve with the coats from that animal in Genesis chapter 3, that this was pointing to a sacrifice that one day would have to be made by the seed of the woman in order to pay for the sins of mankind. And so, why was Cain's offering rejected while Abel's offering was accepted? Abel's was done in faith and Cain's was not. You know, Abel believed in the God that the offering was being lifted up to. Cain was just going through the motions. Cain was religious, but he was lost. Okay, something else. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Suggestion here. Verse number 13. It says, uh, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And so we see a word that's repeated over and over and over again in these verses. And what is that word that's repeated over and over again in these verses? Blood. Blood, that's right. And so... Without the shedding of blood is no remission. We see in the Old Testament that the, uh, uh, the, there, was a, there was ceremony that was given in verse number 13 where the blood of animals was shed as a picture of the coming sacrifice of Christ. In verse number 14, we see that when Christ came, he sacrificed himself and shed his blood in order to purify us from sin. And so it's been suggested that one of the reasons why Cain's offering was rejected while Abel's offering was accepted is because Abel came through blood. And his offering was a blood offering and Cain's offering was not. And so we see faith's offering, I mean faith. Abel's offering was by faith. We see Abel's offering involved the shedding of blood. And then third, we see that Cain's offering, unlike Abel's, was a product of his own labors. Look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so as we think about the offering that Cain gave, I uh, guess, you know, Abel had raised this lamb or, you know, the animal that he sacrificed on the altar. But, uh, but, but Cain was expected, I believe, to give a blood sacrifice for his offering. And instead of giving a blood sacrifice, he did, he sacrificed, he gave what he had done himself. And so it seems like Cain's offering speaks of self-righteousness. In other words, you talk to someone and say, are you a Christian? And they say, yes. Well, how do you know you're a Christian? Well, I'm trying to keep the Ten Commandments. 
you know, what do I always say when someone says that? You say, oh, great. So the Ten Commandments are how you're going to heaven. Can you name them for me? You know, usually they can't. People who say that can't name the Ten Commandments, all ten of them, especially in order. Or they might say, well, I'm just trying to love my neighbor, or I'm just trying to be a good person, or some will even say things like, well, I haven't killed anybody. You know, I haven't cheated on my wife. I haven't, you know, you know, whatever it may be. I don't use God's name in vain. They try to present their own righteousness as a reason for God to accept them. And that seems to be what Cain did here. He said, okay, here's my prize cabbage. You know, here's my prize squash. Oh, here's my beautiful peach right here, or whatever it was. And he brought it and he put it on the altar and said, this is the best I can do. Now I'm accepted with God. And God doesn't accept the best we can do. Because everything we can do, even the plowing of the wicked, is sin. We must come through the blood, the sacrifice of Christ, and by faith. And so as we look at the sacrifice of Abel, why was it accepted? Well, because number one, it was through faith. He was believing in what that sacrifice was supposed to represent. That the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Number two, we see that it was a blood offering. He offered a sacrifice of blood, just like when God killed the animal in order to clothe Adam and Eve after they had sinned in the garden. And third, Cain's offering was a product of his own labors and not according to what God desired in order for a person to be accepted before him. Any question about these two offerings? All right, so here is the question. How did Cain respond to this? All right, how should he have responded? <laughs> Who wants to tell me how he should have responded? Repentance. Repentance, there you go. He should have asked a simple question. Lord, why was my offering not accepted? And what can I do in order to have an acceptable offering next time? But that's not what Cain did. It says here, and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Cain was extremely angry and his face showed it. You know, there's some people out there, and you know them, and you know exactly how they feel based on their facial expressions, okay? You know, it's just interesting, you know, like if, if I'm, you know, upset about something, maybe I'll just kind of have a certain look on my face. And uh, my son Trey especially, he, it's hard for him to hide his emotions. And, you know, and so Cain was angry, and you could see it all over his face, Okay? So how should Cain have responded? Let's look at 1 John chapter 1. The same way that Adam should have responded. Cain should have responded the same way Adam should have responded. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins... God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. How should Cain have responded? He should have come and said, Lord, Jehovah, I've obviously done something wrong. Please instruct me in what I need to do right with this sacrifice. And I will do it. And God will say, you know what? There's nothing you can do. But just have faith in me. You know, trust that my promise is true. That one day I will be victorious over sin through the seed of the woman. And then offer a sacrifice which represents the sacrifice that he is going to give. And that is a blood sacrifice on the altar. And you will be accepted. So how did God respond to Cain? Well, verse number six. And the Lord, Jehovah, said unto Cain, 
Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? Now, do I need to say this again? When God asked these questions, was he looking at Cain's face and sincerely wondering why Cain was so mad? Was he? No. God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. And so when God asks a question, it's not for his own informational purposes. Instead, he asks questions for two reasons. Number one, to help someone process a particular truth. That's what a good teacher does. He asks questions a lot of times, not because he doesn't know the answer, but because he wants to help the students understand it better. And number two, he asks questions to lovingly confront someone over his sin so that he can repent. Remember Genesis chapter 3? It's the same way he dealt with Cain's daddy. Genesis 3 verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? Did he know where he was? Yeah. But he's reaching out to Adam. And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? God knew where Adam was. And God knew what Adam had done. But he was trying to get Adam to understand the gravity of what he had done. And trying to get Adam to come to a point where he confessed, he admitted his sin before God. And what did Adam do? Oh, that woman you gave me. What did the woman do? Oh, that snake you put in the garden. But then, you know, we see them hopefully learning their lesson, but we don't, we don't see that for certain there. So why was Cain angry? Why did his face look so disturbed? It was because his sacrifice, his worship, was not accepted by God. And his brother Abel's was. It wasn't because he wanted to be right with God. It's that he was angry that his brother Abel was right with God. And was accepted before God. And he was not. Jealousy. Jealousy. So verse number seven. And also I think it was an idea of, you know, my way is just as valid as his way. And I think as Heather pointed out, it's also the sense that, you know, Cain meant possession. Man, this is a treasured young man. This is the firstborn son. And they probably treated him that way. And yet Abel's name means vanity, which means emptiness or nothingness. (laughs) And he was probably treated the same way. And so Abel, through how he was treated, perhaps became humble. And Cain, through how he was treated, became proud. And Cain was like one of these young people today that thinks they can't do anything wrong. If you try to correct them, what do they do? They get mad. They get mad. That's where Cain was. But in verse 7, God lovingly says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. What a wonderful statement here. And it's applicable to all of us as well when we get out of sorts with God. When we feel distant from God. Like he's not hearing our prayers and such. It says here, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? (laughs) Cain, if you get your heart right with God and offer an acceptable sacrifice... I will accept your worship and accept your sacrifice. We sang that little chorus today. Do right till the stars fall. Just do right. Sometimes parents say that to kids, do we not? (laughs) Instead of getting all huffy, instead of getting all upset, just do what we ask you to do and everything will be okay. That's what God is saying to Cain. But then he has to give him a warning as well. 
And if thou doest not well, however, if you refuse to repent and to offer an acceptable sacrifice, sin lieth at the door. The word lieth here means it crouches at the door. It's like a wild animal getting ready to pounce on its prey. That's what it's like. Sin is getting ready to destroy you, Cain, if you don't do right, if you don't repent, if you don't offer that acceptable sacrifice, a sacrifice by faith, a blood sacrifice, and one that is not of your own hands, but that I require. What about us? If we do not turn from our sins and trust the perfect sacrifice for our sin, Jesus, sin will tear us up in this life and then condemn us in the next. There we have it, just like Cain. Then this last line comes with some controversy. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. The word him and he there, there's some controversy as to what exactly that is. I believe it's talking about sin in these, this verse. In other words, if Cain gets his heart right and offers an acceptable sacrifice, then sin will still have a desire to dominate Cain, but Cain will bring sin into subjection to himself. That's what I believe this is talking about here. You know, the battle won't be over. <laughs> Sin will still have a desire to dominate Cain. But if he brings the right sacrifice, with God's help, with God's strength, he can be the one who rules over sin instead of sin ruling over him. A lot of good people studying this verse believe the hymn is talking about Abel. Uh, if that is the case, then what this phrase is saying is that if Cain gets his heart right and offers an acceptable sacrifice, he will keep his blessing of being the firstborn son, and therefore he will continue to rule over Abel. I just don't see that meaning in the verse. So what will Cain do? What do most people do when confronted about their sin and the need of a sacrifice for their sin. I'll never forget giving a track to the secretary at the place where I bought my glasses when I was growing up. And the track said on the front, are you saved? And she said, saved from what? And I explained, from our sin. The Bible says that... Uh, you know, we were shaped in iniquity and in sin did our mother conceive us. We have original sin that we have to deal with. And I remember her saying just bluntly, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. <laughs> you know, just rejecting the, the Bible doctrine that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, when people are confronted about their sin, in more cases than not, when they're told that they're a sinner out of sorts with God, that the only way they can take care of that sin is to have a relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ who gave himself as a sacrifice for their sins, paying the penalty of death for their sins. They say, ooh, that's a bloody religion. No. But most people are repulsed by the idea that they're not inherently good and that they need a savior and that they're a sinner. As the hymn writer put it, Saved a what? A wretch like me. Another hymn writer talked about such a worm as I. These are two words that a lot of your modern hymn books kind of whitewash and take out. So what was Cain's response? Did he fall on his knees, cry out to God, Show me your way, Lord, and whatever it is, I submit to you, and I will do it. I will believe. It's a reaction we all ought to have, isn't it, when we're confronted about our sin. And we were warned that sin will destroy us 
if we allow it to remain in our lives. Verse number 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. Hey, brother, how you doing? And it came to pass when they were in the field. Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Cain killed Abel. Instead of getting right with God, he decided to persecute the one who was right with God. The one who troubled his conscience every time he saw him. And that's what this world is doing today. As this world goes into sin, things the Bible clearly calls sin. It's not even gray areas anymore. They want to get rid of the person who is trying to live righteously. They want to get rid of the person who's trying to take a stand for what is right. And as my pastor in Kentucky used to say, he said, if they didn't have laws, they'd kill us. <laughs> well, that's a pretty strong statement. With some of the sentiment I'm seeing today, I, I kind of believe that. You know, when, when we walk down the street and people know we have a godly testimony, that's important, in our personal lives, and we try to witness to people of their need of a Savior because of their sinful state, it is going to naturally rub people the wrong way. And you know, a lot of times we don't have to separate from friends who are practicing sin. But if we take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and live the way that he would have us to live to his glory, what happens to all those friends who are involved in sin? They scatter a lot of times and don't want anything to do with us. Look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Beginning verse 11. See Cain being mentioned in the New Testament. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And why did he slew him? <laughs> Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. It's very interesting, one of the people I was studying after for this lesson went to James chapter 1. And we see this illustrated in the life of Cain and Abel. But it says, uh, verse number 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin, when it is in sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. And they said this is exactly what happened in the case of Cain with Abel. We see here that there was a, an anger and a hatred toward his brother Abel for being right with God. And that anger, that hatred resulted in what? It resulted in Cain physically killing. When it became sin, Cain physically killed Abel. It is a literal fulfillment of James 1, verses 14 and 15. And so what do we see God doing? Well, what we see in verse number 9 is after Cain killed Abel, we see God mercifully and graciously reaching out to Cain, calling him to repentance. He does it with a question. Isn't that how God operates? And what we're going to see is next time how Cain responds to God's gracious 